Okay, um, we have a few things to finish up on forms. Um, they relate to, number one, some of the more forms controls that we haven't covered yet. I think we've covered uh, several of them, but there's a, a few more that we haven't gotten yet. So we'll do those today. Um, next thing we're going to talk about after that is HTML5 form controls. In other words, all the form controls that we've been talking about so far have been in HTML for a while. So I'm going to talk about some of the new form controls and um, what the benefits of them are and what the disadvantages are. And there really aren't any disadvantages, I guess, but we'll look at, we'll look at them. Uh, we'll talk about styling forms. In other words, how do you use CSS with forms to, um, to make them look good in addition to being accessible? Then finally, we're going to talk about accessibility in forms. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to all these today, but uh, we'll get through most of them, and we'll finish up any loose ends on Wednesday. So let's see what we've done so far. Let me download the example. plan on getting to your designs, those of you that have turned it in, by next class to get them graded. Am I in the right class? I'm in the wrong class. So this is where we left off last time. I'm going to pick just one of these. I'm going to for pick form drop down. We'll start off talking about that. Um, this does have some styling in it already, which we have not talked about. Um, but in this case, this is a web search through Google. And we can put in a search term. And we can put in a language. And we can see our search results using that language. Um, we'll look at this. And what we have is our action, again, is the script that we're sending the form data to. The, the server side script is going to process the form. Method get simply means we're going to pass the data along the query string. That goes around the whole form. Um, the uh, form has two things, a text box and a language. And again, I got these things by looking at what the server-side script expects. So again, in an actual project, you will be possibly the person that creates a server-side script, or someone on your team will be. So they'll be able to tell you what you need to call everything. Uh, in this case, I looked at the query string after I did a search, and I saw what different things were called. So. Um, we have a text box, which is simply input type equals text, and it has a name and an ID. Um, we have a drop down, which is a select with a series of options. The select has an ID and a name. The options have the text of the option, which is between the option tag and a value. The text of the option tag 
uh, is simply is what the user is going to see. So that's something that they'll be able to make sense of. The value is something that the script expects. So the script is expecting language of English, if we select that, to be lang underscore en. So that's what I give it. Same thing with all these other languages as well. Finally, we have a submit button, which sends the value to the server. Now, let's look at two things in this before we go on and look at the other uh, form controls. First of all, notice for every form control, there's a label. And the label uses the ID to connect the label with the form control. So the label tag says label for AS underscore Q. That ties this to the thing that has the ID of AS underscore Q. What's the purpose, purpose of this? Again, it's an accessibility issue. We can see with our eyes that search is related to this text box and language is related to that text box. We just know that because that's how they're positioned on the screen. However, if someone's accessing this with a screen reader, they're not going to know what is associated with what as they use their tab key to, pull or, uh, to, to, to navigate around. That's what, the, that's what the label tag does. The label tag says, this text, which can be read to them, search, is associated with the thing that has the ID of AS, AS uh, underscore Q. So that's why you're going to see a name and an ID on both things. Now, oftentimes, they're going to be the same, all right, with probably everything but radio buttons. I generally make the ID and the um, name the same. Remember, they serve two different roles. The name is what the server is expecting. The ID is what I'm going to use for a label to associate the text of a label with this form control. In this case, it's the same thing for the select. I say label for LR. That means a thing that has an ID of LR. So this is a thing that has an ID of LR. So you see for, you can more or less read in your mind for ID, for the ID of this. So that's a good way to make your forms more accessible. That's so a good step that you can take. It's not that hard, right, if you do this as you're building the form. The other thing to do is, as far as styling it goes, a form is really a list of values that you're going to send to the server. That's really what a form is. Therefore, I put forms in ULs for unordered list. It's unordered because things don't have to be in this order. I mean, I could have put language before the search term, and it, would have worked. It, it wouldn't be any more or less logical. So it's an unordered list. Each form element is an li tag. And so is the submit button. And then I do some things styling-wise that's pretty simple. I give the UL a list of a uh, list style type of none, so that gets rid of the bullet points. The second thing I do is for the label, I say text align right and give it a fixed width and give it a display of inline block. What that does is that gives me a form that looks like this, where all the text boxes are aligned, all the form controls are aligned this way, and the text is aligned right. So I get this nice little form where all these things are in alignment. If I got rid of this line, it would look like that, where things didn't line up as well. All right, That doesn't look as neat. You had a question? Yeah, uh, you remember, this is how we did like the first example. Uh, it's better to have the style in an external file. In this example, I have it as part of the HTML. 
simply because I want to be able to show both at the same time. Okay. So yeah, you would you would still put this in its own file like we've been doing. Okay, this is a label. It says label for as underscore q. That means that this label tag is associated with the thing that has the ID as underscore q, which is this input tag. So this is the linkage between the label and the input. All right? So that's what ties those two together. So that a screen reader or assistive technology, people that are accessing this that are blind, their screen reader will be able to say, hey, what is this text box? Because if it tried to read the text box, it couldn't make any sense of it. But it will say, hey, the label for this is found in the thing that has a label for the same ID. So it'll be able to read the label of search for that. And therefore, the person will know, hey, that's what I type in what I'm searching for. So it's the ID that associates the label with the form tag. Or, or not the form tag, but the, but the form control that we're inputting data in. And same thing for this. This label, language, is associated with this dropdown. Therefore, the select tag has ID equals LR on that. So essentially, for every form control you have, you're going to have a label tag. And that label tag is going to contain what's in that form control. And then you're going to tie the, I, the label to the form control by using the ID. You're going to match up the ID in this one with the ID of that one. All right. What are some other form controls that we looked at last time? Well, we looked at a radio button. That looks like this. Where essentially it's the same thing as a drop down, the difference being that you see everything all at one time. All right? In other words, um, you see all the different selections for um, the radio button all at once. So I could probably style this a little bit neater by doing something like this. make each one of these their own li tag. I'm going to put an li that says choose language. And then I'm going to put a label tag around each of these. All right. Now again, each, re each input should have its own ID. So I'm going to go in and put a label tag for English. I didn't want to do that.
And then on the English radio button, I'm going to say ID equals N. So that's what ties these two together. This label that says English points, refers to this radio button. And I'll do the same for the other view. Each of these labels are going to say four, and they're going to match the ID that I'm going to give each of the radio buttons. So the label for Spanish is going to match that radio button, because that's the radio button you check if you want Spanish and so on down the line. So now if we look at this, looks a little bit, a little bit nicer. And remember, what ties radio buttons together are um, that they have the same name. So radio buttons are going to have a name and they're going to have an ID. The name for all the radio buttons in a group is going to be the same. The ID is going to be different. Remember, you never have two things on the page with the same ID, whereas two things can have the same name. So these radio buttons can all have the same name. They all have a name of LR. All right? And that's what is going to be sent to the server. I'm going to make the width of these a little bit more. Now it looks like that. All right. Um, the next few things I'm going to do, really the server isn't going to use. I'm just going to put form controls on the page, um, and the server isn't really going to use them. All right. Um, but I'm going to do them just to show you how to put different things on the, on, uh, the page. So we have things called checkboxes. And checkboxes are where you have choices that are not mutually exclusive. For example, the choice for language is mutually exclusive. You can pick English, or you can pick Spanish, you can pick, pick French, you can pick Chinese. But you can't pick two of them. You can only pick one. Whereas I could have a list of things that you are interested in. You know, what are topics that you are interested in? Um, and uh, in that case, um, you could pick several topics that you're interested in. All right. I'm actually going to save a different version of this page. that I'm not going to send to Google to include these new fields. All right, so maybe we have, instead of a search box, we have a name. And instead of language, we have state.
I won't do all of the states, but I'll do a couple of them. I'm going to change the action just to be send it back to this page, which isn't uncommon. A lot of times in server-side scripting, a form will send the, the, the uh, request back to itself. Let's say I have a radio button for my interested in CISS. Maybe this is an interest form that high school students could fill in about the college. To do a checkbox, you say input type equals. Checkbox, or is it just check? Let me look that up. Type equals checkbox. And this will be a yes or no checkbox. Now, let's say we had a bunch of other areas that someone could be interested in. Are you interested in accounting? Are you interested in nursing? We look at this page then. Each one of these is an independent thing that we can check on or check off. These don't work together like the radio button does. All right, so these are not mutually exclusive choices. You can check two of them, you can check three of them, you can check none of them. Whereas with the radio button, you can check at most one of them. All right, so that's the difference between a checkbox and a radio button. So like, think of that in terms of what you would use for your assignment where you're picking a pizza, all right? where you're defining a pizza. Um, something like whether it's delivery or pickup, you'd want that to maybe be in a drop down. All right? Because then you could say delivery or pickup, and they could pick only one. You can't have an order that's part delivery. You'll pick up half the pizza and deliver the other half. right? It doesn't make any sense. But things like toppings, those, can, those have no association to each other. You could pick all the toppings, or you could pick none of the toppings. So consider, when you're making the form, like what the rules are. Is this something where I'm only allowed one option, one choice for this given thing? Or can I mix and match yeses and nos in any sort of way that I want? So that will determine if you pick a radio button or a drop down. Several things on a form you could do several ways. If you had a yes or no question, for example, you could have a drop down that said yes or no. You could have radio buttons that said yes or no. You could have a check box where if it was checked, it would mean yes. If it was unchecked, it would mean no. So do whatever makes sense for the form that you're doing. You have options, but remember, um, 
Again, the idea that checkboxes are not linked together, whereas choices from a drop-down and choices from a radio button are. Okay? Um, I'm going to make these a little wider as well. And I'm going to add the last control that we're going to look at for now, a text area. And a text area is good when you have multiple lines of text. For example, someone's name is just going to be one line of text. Whereas comments that they put in, you might have several lines of comments. You might have a paragraph of comments. So we use a text area if you have more than just a single line. So for a name, you'd use a text box. For comments, you would use a text area. And that gives you a text area where you can put in unlimited amount of stuff. And of course, through CSS, you can make that bigger if you want, if you want to give even more space for that. Now, these are sort of the basic pre-HTML5 form controls. There's a couple other ones. There's a password control, whereas if you say type equals password, if they type in the text box, you can't see it. will show like dots instead of the letters. So um, that's what people use to put passwords in on the web. Um, there are plain buttons, which don't send directly to the server, but allow you to invoke some JavaScript. And we'll talk about those when we talk about JavaScript. Finally, there are reset buttons that I avoid because one thing I hate is when you uh, go and enter data and you accidentally click the reset button. How do you um, how do you search for classes here at LC? Do you know what page you go to? Let's see. I can find this like about half the time. Student resources. Class schedule, search for, all right. I, I think I'm actually thinking of another page. One that's the advanced search. Uh, never mind. A reset essentially clears out all the text boxes. What I don't like about the reset is, is very often it just confuses people. And they'll click it and they'll accidentally clear off their, uh, the data that they've entered in the text box. That's especially bad if you're talking about big forms. Um, probably many of you have, have entered in data into the FAFSA form. All right, which is a long, long form. And on each, each page, it actually has multiple pages. And each page has a lot of text boxes and stuff to fill in. Well, can you imagine if you wanted to click Next and you accidentally clicked Clear and you end up resetting a whole form? That would really be annoying. So I avoid using reset buttons. Um, there is something called a form area.
field set. I'm sorry, form area, field set. That's when you have sections of your form. So for this, I could say this form really consists of two field sets. The first one relates to general information. So I'll make two unordered lists, one for the general information and one for the interest. And underneath there, you can put a legend which describes what the field set is about. This is useful both for accessibility and for people that can, uh, are, are not uh, disabled because it allows them to organize the information on the form. So notice what it does by default. I forgot to put my N field set tag in. So by default, it groups things together like that. So I can see, and again, I can change that via CSS if I want to do something, if I want to make things bigger, if I want to make the legend bigger. I can say legend font size 1.5M, color blue. And that will make the, the legend of the form even bigger. Yeah. For the CSS or the HTML? OK. The HTML will have, you'll have a field set around the group of fields that go together on your form. And inside the field set, you'll have a legend. And the legend is a description of that field set. Yes. And then the CSS, really you can do whatever I want. I just chose to make it bigger and a color of blue. If I wanted a different border on the field set, I could say field set border two pixels solid blue. I get that. Now, notice that these are all HTML form elements. Uh, a text box is a text box, which means you can put any text data into it. So anything you can type, you can type into a text box. A radio button can have no values if you don't select any of them. A dropdown is always going to have the first value selected uh, by default, unless you specify otherwise. You can specify radio buttons to be default by saying checked. 
Uh, you can specify te check boxes to be checked by saying checked, and you can specify drop-down elements to be selected by saying selected. So selected equals selected, checked equals checked. That will, by default, select them. But there's nothing that's going to validate in HTML, at least in previous versions of HTML. So if I hit go, it's going to send it to the server no matter what we have in here. There's no validation done. All right? And therefore, people had to write JavaScript to do the validation for it. And JavaScript is a language we're going to learn uh, starting uh, in a couple classes, all right, probably next week. All right? Um, but for now, in HTML, there's really nothing you can do unless you use the HTML5 controls. All right? Well, what's so good about the HTML5 controls? Well, they've created separate controls for different things on your page. For example, if it's a number, you can create a control to say only allow the entry of a number. If it is a date, only allow a valid date. If it's an email, only allow a valid email. Now that sounds great because that frees you from having to do JavaScript validation for those things. There's a catch though. Old browsers don't support HTML5 controls. And it's the same problem that we had before. And we can use can I use to see if it supports HTML5 controls. So can I use The color input type. Well, I can in Internet. I cannot in Internet Explorer, and I cannot in Safari until 10.1, and I can't in iOS Safari. So if I'm developing of something that's going to be used on an iPhone, the color won't work. Well, that's bad news, but it's not horrible news because if the browser doesn't understand a certain input type, it simply makes it a text box which is back to where you were before HTML5. So that's an example of what we call graceful degradation. In other words, it doesn't work, but it degrades, it, it, it downgrades itself to what it, the way it used to work, and you're no really worse off than not using it. So let's go to W3C schools. And let's look at HTML5 forms controls. For new input types. All right, this reviews the old ones. Type equals text, type equals password. So like if we type in our password, we see the dots if we say type equals password. Type equals submit, we covered that one. Type equals reset, that's the one we said we're not going to use, all right, because people accidentally click on it, and it resets the form. Type radio, uh, we talked about that. Here's the reset again, if you type into it, and reset it, resets it to the default values. Type equals checkbox, type equals button, and here's the HTML5. For example, we have an input for color. So if we had a form that says, you know, let the user choose the color of their page, we could have a, for, uh, a form that allowed them to enter the color. And by clicking on it, they get their operating system's color um, dialog box. So I could pick, yeah, maybe I want this shade of green. And it will represent it as that shade of green. When I send it to the server, it'll send the hex code for the color. So it can save that and make your page that color. If I go and try to run this on Internet Explorer, it is not going to work.
notice what I get. I get a plain old text box. And if I enter it in right, it'll work just like it should. The only difference is I can enter any garbage in here, and I can submit the query, and it's going to accept it. So I'd have to write some JavaScript to handle that, to make sure that we entered a color that was, was a legal color. All right? So it doesn't mean that you don't use these HTML5 controls. It just means that for now, until we're sure that no one is running that version of Internet Explorer, we have to be able to compensate for it. And we have to be able to have JavaScript or some other mechanism um, to uh, make sure that it doesn't break if they use this. An input type equals date. All right, you get the month, day, year, and you get the little calendar control. So if I were to pick Thanksgiving, I could pick Thanksgiving. Again, does this work in Internet Explorer? Probably not. All right. But what do we get? We get a text box. This Well, again, graceful degradation, graceful downgrading of it. It might not work as slick as it does in more updated browsers, but at least it doesn't break. And by writing some JavaScript, we can ensure that we don't lose any functionality if they have versions of, old versions of um, the browser. Date time allows us to put a day and a time in. Input type equals email. We have to put a valid email address, so put that in valid. If we don't put that in, if I type in something that's uh, an invalid email address and click support or submit, boom, I get a message up and it knows that that's not valid. It knows that it's not valid because an email address always contains the app. All right? So it knows that that is not valid. We have a month choice. We have a number choice. So if I, can, if I can only enter something in between 1 and 5, if I type in 9, it'll tell me that that's not correct. If I type in, I can't even type in something that's not a number. But if I type in something that's valid, it goes and submits that. Here's a range where I have something I can work like a volume control. You know, how much did you uh, like that movie? One end would be I loved it, one end would be I hate it. If you really liked it, well, you could set it like that. If you hated it, you could set it like that. How would this view again in a browser that doesn't support it? Well, it would work, it just wouldn't work as cool. I would just get a plain old text box. Oh, actually, no. Internet Explorer does support this. I actually like how Internet Explorer supports it better than how Chrome supports it, right? Because it actually shows you the numeric value along with that. And again, just to, just to repeat something that I've said all along, by writing good HTML code, you can minimize the chance of having browser compatibility issues, but you can, never pr you can never prevent browser compatibility issues. There's always a chance that there's going to be something that doesn't work in one browser. It could be an older browser, or it could be a bug in the browser, or whatever. Therefore, it's important to test. Have I talked about using the validator in this class to go in and validate your code? All right, we'll have to talk about that on Wednesday. That's another good thing that you can do, is run and validate your code. All right, so we'll talk about that on Wednesday. If I forget, please mention that to me. All right, this sort of wraps up forms. Um, on Wednesday, I want to talk about validating your code, and I also want to talk about tables. So we'll start talking about tables. 
what to use them for and what not to use them for. All right? Any questions? Yes. Well, every, every week there's a new assignment. All right? So, no, we don't, we don't have exams in this course. We just have assignments and, uh, and the project. Well, <laughs> Uh, this class seems a natural for a project. I mean, I would, uh, you know, some classes where it doesn't make sense, or some classes I have you really don't know enough to do a project until like the very end of the class, whereas this class you can kind of start a project and then finish it up the last few weeks. But uh, yeah, so there, there's only projects and, and assignments. The only, there's only the project, rather, and, and weekly assignments. No quizzes or or, well, we, I mean, if, if you want one, I could put one up there, but it won't count for the grade. All right. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, we'll see you up in lab.